Yes, it's Toby Tamarkin. When did you first come to MCC? Uh, when the college was either three or four years old. I was trying to remember the exact date. I think it was 1968. I think it was 68. How did you find out about the place? It was, um, I had two choices. I had just completed my master's degree, and I had the choice of going to um, a seminary uh, located near West Hartford. I'm trying to think of the name now. At any rate, and teaching literature courses to priests who were going to be using Spanish, or there was an opening at a place called Manchester Community College. And the community colleges were such a new concept that when I, I talked to some friends, they said, you know, and myself, I decided a better future would be with a new institution that was growing. And so I joined, I went and I was interviewed by Monsieur Buron, who was a French teacher, and he hired me. So, and that's how I started. No search committee. There was no search committee. He just talked to me. Basically, he wanted to know what was the name Tamarkin. <laughs> he wanted to know what my ethnicity was. That was how I, <laughs> and I said Russian. I pretended I didn't know because I had no idea what he was try trying to find out. And he smiled and he said, you're hired. Uh huh. So, so where, where, what building were you um, housed in, or where were you teaching them? It was in the uh, Bidwell Street, and the uh, very first building that had the stairway in the middle, and uh, what was that called? I can't remember now. It was the very, very first place where we had classes. Hartford I think Road they were all on Hartford Road, Hartford Road building, and I was. I had no office. I so Mario F Ma Mario Fiandello was his name, is. and still is. He invited me to use his office. He had an extra desk in his office, and that was my office because I began teaching in the evenings. So I was hired full-time, but I had all night classes my first semester. So you must remember the move to uh, Faculty East? Yes. And did you get your own office there? <laughs> when I got to Faculty East, yes, I had my own office. I was teaching, though. I was... Um, I had my own office, and we were, at that time, very close to people who were also in math science. I, so I got, I became very good friends with um, a lot of the science teachers. What but, was the um, culture like around the college? I mean, you know, the interaction between faculty, staff, students. It was, it was the most wonderful place. Uh, well, those were the days in the 70s where the students were, we were all starting to be active against the war in Vietnam. And the students were all up in arms, and the faculty were young in those days and sympathetic to their causes. And the faculty as a group were more like a family. It was a very unusual circumstance. And above all, the area that I was in, the humanities, and even members of the, of the science and math group, we were kind of very, very close because our offices were so close. And the kind of offices they were when we moved here in these Quonset huts, you could hear everything going on next door on either side of you. There was very little privacy in your office. But it was kind of an open uh, forum for people. And that continued. People were so friendly. and It continued, and we got people in, in fact, um, we had two people, one from math, uh, Lois Grand George, Alice. Alice. Alice Grand George, and Lois Ryan. Those two began something that was a little bit later on, but it's just indicative of what went on, that they'd pick a time once a week when people were free, they'd look to see, and they had like Tuesdays at 2, they had a Wednesdays at 1, and anybody from the campus, any faculty member could come down there they would provide cookies, cakes, refreshments, and you'd just sit around and talk and not complain. It was a time to talk about things that were going on at school, ideas, things that you could do in your classroom, and it made uh, for a wonderful learning experience and for bonding faculty member to faculty member. Anybody could come down, and if they did have a bad day, there were all these other people there to listen to the problem and discuss it and talk with them and People just felt better. It was just a that kind of time. You don't find that so much. <clears throat> so, who were 
some of your colleagues who made a particular impression on you? I became very close with Marianne Bianchi. She taught uh, in biology and sexual, human sexuality. She had one of the most popular courses on campus because she was mince no words. <clears throat> we all wanted to be in there and pay attention. She was one. Bob Dobson was another, and he taught biology. Um, I was very friendly with, uh, with most of the members of the English department, but they, they became close, very close friends, lifetime friends. Let me give you a couple of names, and you tell me what comes to mind. Uh, Roland Cherico. <laughs> Roland Cherico, one of the wonderful things was I took um, a workshop with him on how to take a better picture. <laughs> and actually, fill the frame became my motto for life, and I do take better pictures. Um, and he, of course, his trumpet, he, he contributed a lot. And he was a, you know, a little difficult at times because I got, after teaching, I did become division director of humanities and communication arts. So then I was, of course, the supervisor for all these people who are my good friends. And the wonderful part was, see, and I didn't realize it at the time, that people trusted me and everybody got along. We were, at the time, <clears throat> humanities was really, the classes weren't very full, business had most of the students in it, and so we thought we could make a comeback for the humanities if we all worked together. And so we had five committees, and we called it, Dr. Richardson called it Resurgamos, right? We're going to resurge. We're coming, coming back like Phoenix. So <clears throat> we had one that was called Academic Alliance. And um, so... I think it, I'm trying to remember who was in charge of that. Elaine Horn was in charge of that. And she got together at, with a, got a group, a couple of other teachers from here, and then she, they reached out to the, all of the high schools, Rockville High, all of the schools in the area, and said, let's work together. And what that did was build a bond for students who were then transferring to come to the Manchester Community College, and they were f familiar with the people in the humanities and all of that. That was one. Another committee was done by uh, Suzanne and John Stevens, and that was to raise money. We never had enough money for things, and they didn't have enough money for models for their art, for their actual classes. And so in order to do that and to do other things, to help support some of the other things we wanted to do, like Roland Chirico's working on The Edge, that was a third committee, was to promote ourselves with brochures and with he was going to do the fabulous film about our wonderful humanities division and it was called The Edge which he was forever updating and working on but for money for that they raised the money by putting together auctions and we would bring things in and they would bring their artwork in and then wealthy people really from the town people who could afford it would come and we had a regular auction with refreshments and we made hundreds of dollars that paid for that it was our own in those days we could do this we had our own account we put the money in and we used it for school projects and it helped defray our best thing that we did the best committee was the weekend in the humanities experience amazingly we were unionized at the time. I had helped start the Four Cs with Bob Vader and other people and Sid Lipshires. We, I was one of the people who believed in it at the time, having been a woman who had not received a promotion in lieu of giving a promotion to men a couple of times. This was very early on, um, but then it was made up for. That's why when I went, it was amazing. When I went from associate professor to full professor, I got the highest raise, the most thousands of dollars, and that was because of the discrepancy. When I started here were the days when I was told, you know, you're the second income in your family. You don't need as much money, so we're going to start you at X. And everyone else was starting at Y. So when I finally went to full professor, I had to make the same as all the other Ys. I got this huge raise, and I remember because I was at the Board of Trustees meeting that they said, Look at this. I mean, it was noticeable, that, but that's what happened. At any rate, back to the weekend in the humanities. The, <clears throat> we thought, how could we get students who come to Manchester Community College to be more aware of the importance of looking at reading literature, 
thinking about poetry, thinking about music and art. They really didn't have the background many times to even understand about that. So what we did was decide to take a theme and to show it to students over a period of time. And what would make it appealing to them would be give them a credit. It cost them $25. And these unionized faculty members started at, on Friday after classes at 4. We would have about 80 to 100 students. We would put them in groups of 15. All of our faculty participated. They were mentors leading groups of 15 students, or they did workshops. They did part of the workshops. And we would put the students through, first I did a, a social thing to teach them about other, I, it was called um, the Hokies and the Helots, it was called. It was an interpersonal game where you have two cultures that coincide, that are opposite to one another. We started with that, just as an icebreaker. And then they would go through a poetry pro Pro program. They did a music program where Bob Richardson came in. He was dressed as not Mozart. Who was he? As uh, and he would play a classical theme. And then Charlie Giuliani, who was our professor of music, he would get up from the piano. Charlie would sit down and he would continue playing the the classical theme. And then he would talk about what was going on in his head as he turned it into a jazz theme. And the students would see what music was about, and it, it, we would explain. And then John and Suzanne Stevens and Bob Manning would show them the same kind of thing with art. Here's how art began, and here's the, how it developed through the ages, and here's where we are now. This went on Friday from 4 to 10 at night, all day Saturday, and half day Sunday. Our faculty didn't get one penny in pay. Not only did they work with these students in little groups to discuss each thing that they saw, and the kids had workbooks, the students had workbooks that they had to do and work on in groups with their mentor, but the faculty went out, got the food, prepared dinner on Friday night, lunch on Saturday, breakfast on Sunday morning, cleaned the facilities, because we had to keep it clean. We did all of that for, for no penny at all just because, as a team, they were so wonderful together and they were so wonderful to me. This became apparent when I retired from Manchester Community College. I went to another college in Massachusetts as the academic dean, where the faculty would not give 10 minutes of their time if it wasn't in the union booklet that they were to do so. That's how unusual this college was. That's why it's a great college today. It was a most incredible college when I was here. It was the faculty that made it that way. We had a very unusual group of people, and that's what made it great. I don't think you find that too often in a school. Uh, so. uh, well, you mentioned um, someone earlier um, who was responsible for taking minutes at many of the uh, division meetings, Michael Duremo. <laughs> yes. A few words about Mr. <laughs> Duremo. <laughs> yes, we got... We had some fabulous teachers that came on board and were part of all of this. And one was Michael Duremo. Um, most people don't want to go to the division meetings. You know, once a month you have a division meeting where everybody is supposed to attend. And we made Mike Duremo our um, secretary. He was the division secretary. And he began taking minutes. And the minutes were so funny that people couldn't wait till they came out. And it's, so at the end, at, when I retired, he p took the minutes and he put them together into a book with my name on it, and it was called Minute by Minute <laughs> because of the minutes he took, and it was called Volume 1 of the Tamarkin Years and the Collected Division Meeting. And they even had, he even had with his face, picture on it, I don't know if you can see this, a, an advertisement about this coming out. The collection you've waited for, the motions, the calls to order the votes, every exciting moment of a division meeting is here. And it was so because his minutes were so silly. And he would, I'll give you some of the ways he'd close. You know how he would close saying, you know, uh, your, your secretary or whatever? Let, me, let a smile be your umbrella. Yours without actually feeling it. This is just his, his closings. 
It's a Wrap, Mike DeRamo. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Oh, submitted. So it was, here's one that's not. Submitted for M. DeRamo by R. Richardson. You see, not one funny thing. All right. <laughs> they should all be this brief, he said, Mike DeRamo, because it was a very short one. Respectfully submissive, Mike DeRamo. Keep your eye on the ball, <laughs> Mike DeRamo. And so on. I mean, yours, I'm black velvet. <laughs> and so um, what I will do so that some of you have the chance to look at these is I'm going to leave this book here so that we can take some of the funnier pages and and have them go into the book about Manchester Community College in those days. And that will give you an idea of what was going on in our division as well as uh, the humor that was behind it. And again, it was because of those things. It was because we got together in collegiality for these Tuesdays at 2. Each person contributed. Even it, even if you thought they weren't, um, for example, Charlie Giuliani, he hated meetings. He did not want to attend any meetings. I said to him, if you will, every time there's a humanities weekend, do that. And every time that someone needs you for piano for any reason, do that. I'll excuse you from some of these meetings. And that was our deal, and he did it. He, for some reason, said he just couldn't sit there. I could understand that because he was a colleague of mine, and I knew what, how great he was. He was probably the best piano player that I ever heard play. Um, uh, I used to go and listen to him when he was doing some of his gigs. And so I knew what his value was. And if I had to criticize somebody when I was division chair for their teaching, they were good about it. Uh, John Gustafson, he had some problems, and he would tell me, I am so sorry when, he'd, when I'd have to say something to him. I mean, I never got, how could you say that and all. And in fact, when I first started as division chair, we had an inf- I had an unfortunate experience here because I had a former Marine who was our academic dean, and for some reason, he, I don't know why he didn't like me. Um, because the first thing that happened when he met me was I was getting an award for something and I took him along, but he just didn't, didn't like me. And he, he gave me this completely unfair negative review. And the entire division rose up and wrote a letter and took it up and insisted it be put in my file. And Sid Lipshires put pressure on him from the union and, and he had to take that bad review out. So we had faculty that stuck together and helped one another in unbelievable ways. And it was for me, I just loved this school. And I loved the students. For me, community college is the most exciting place to teach and work. It always will be. And and I just, and I really appreciate the people who do their teaching there. My daughter teaches in a community college. She's at Springfield Tech teaching biology. And she agrees that it's the best place to be. Now, you also uh, were the first person to lead a student trip um, yes. camp, well, overnight off campus. Yes. I, um, I was married and had two small children at the time. And I went to a meeting, and I knew teachers took students on trips. We had never done that at Manchester. <clears throat> and I went to a meeting where a fellow was talking about taking students on trips, and he literally said, if you can't take your students to a, a Spanish or French-speaking country, stop teaching the language. Get out of the business. I was like, wow. So I decided, okay, I'm going to plan a trip. And unlike those who usually go Mexico, Spain, I thought, Most of the people who speak Spanish and live in our area are from Puerto Rico. That's where I should take these students so they would better understand that culture. And it would be good for them because there's the same, the, a lot of things look the same. The currency is the same and the, the uh, postal system, the, 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 um, uh, the postmen drive around in vehicles that look just like ours. There's reasons. At any rate, I put together a trip. And this is how long ago it was that we went to Puerto Rico. We stayed at the University of Puerto Rico for one week. We had airfare, a place to stay, 
three meals a day and all our activities, the entire thing cost each student $99 for the week. They also got two credits, <laughs> but they put in the time. They, I had a very interesting way. I mean, they didn't just go. They had to, they worked in little groups and they had to interview people during the day in Spanish, come back with their notes of the interviews of the things that they saw. Then I put them into other groups where they had to sit around, discuss what they saw, and they had to write mini dramas to talk about a difference in the culture that they found and bring that back when we came back. Each They had to put them on as a skit at the end for each other some of their mini-dramas, and then they brought it back to the school, and they could share it with the students who weren't able to go on the trip, who couldn't afford it. So that was the first of many trips that I took, and then trips just became a part of things here at the college. What are some of the other things that you wanted to talk about? I know you have kind of given this some thought. Um, I think uh, I've done almost everything that was on my list, to tell you the truth. <laughs> um, well, I if you look back at your t tenure here, your time yeah. here, what are you most proud of in terms of your accomplishments? Um, I'm proud of a, of a Spanish course that I started uh, that I didn't mention. Um, this is a community college, and I believed that it would be better for our students who went past the first year into their second year and hopefully a third year if they could speak the language and understand it rather than reading literature because I felt they would be able to use it in their job. So I tried to put together, and I did, a program, and I was one of the first, in those days it was high tech, to use TV. We recorded on, <laughs> on site, as John Murray well knows, we recorded on site different situations, things in the hospital, taking an x-ray, taking a blood test, hospital admissions, social services, you know, talking to people who came in for, come in for help. And I put those together into lessons in business, social sciences, and, and the health fields. And for my second year, students worked, they learned these, this vocabulary, because there's, this, there's a common vocabulary in everyday work settings of, let's say, 1,500 words. And so in the second year, that is what they learned. They learned these situations and to simulate these situations by watching it on TV. And I used a special little technique with them and then working with a partner. And ch they had to change the situations around to what I, you know, to something else. If it was somebody was sick to their stomach, now they had to be pick another illness just to expand their vocabulary. And so I matched it and I had very good success. I had a lot of students write me or come back and tell me that they were hired specifically because they could use Spanish on the, in the workforce. And uh, so I was very proud of doing that. But I was most proud of the people in the humanities and communications and even carrying over into sociology because they participated as well, who worked so well with me to bring back the humanities because I think what we did as a group was take it from something where there were very few students to becoming the most popular area of the of the college while I was here. Now, with your background and credentials, you could have had a career at a baccalaureate institution. Mm -hmm. Are you happy that you uh, worked in community college? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because, you know, my favorite thing in the world is teaching. In fact, here at this college, when you're a division dean, you still have to teach one course. And when I used to go in and say to the students, I'm so happy to be here. This is my favorite part of the day because <clears throat> I love teaching, and that's what community colleges are supposed to do. Their emphasis is on teaching. So, no, I was never unhappy that I wasn't at a back, and I was in certainly not unhappy that I passed on the seminary's job <laughs> teaching literature, which would have been a whole different ex lifetime. So I, I enjoyed it so much. If you were talking to someone who had just been hired to start <clears throat> their community college teaching career this fall, yeah. what advice would you impart? Um, I would tell them to look at the students carefully and to understand that there's going to be a wide diversity in the classroom 
and to really think about how they could reach each one, to not just use one way of teaching, to try to use various techniques to get across their ideas, and to let the students participate as much as possible because they can help each other and, and work with each other, I think. And also, to, to they'll know soon enough who some of the best teachers in their division are to seek advice from people who've been here. Is there anything else you want to add? I'm just thrilled that you invited me to come back and to, to say something about this college mm -hmm. because um, I spent so many years here, I just get teary. It's, uh, this was the most wonderful thing I, that could have happened to me. I mean, I changed as a person. I was a very naive young person when I came here. Um, I really didn't understand things that were changing then. Women, women's role in the world was completely different. What I had learned as a child and growing up, and when I came here, I grew with the with people like Marianne Bianchi and others. I grew as a person, as well as along with my students. And I don't think that would have happened any other place. So. Chuck, is Chuck still here? Chuck, anything we missed? No, I think you covered it all. <laughs> I did. That was a wonderful interview. Yeah. Well, well you thank know. you very and, much. Um, yeah.